prayers how you were able to to get the consent of the elders, you know, because my question actually is, you know, what uh, conflicts or tensions did you encounter when you first started the concept, you know? Because uh, I come from a country which is, uh, in which most communities, it's, it's archipelagic, you know, I come from the Philippines, and there's a lot of uh, opinions, you know, I, I think it's too much democratic, but somehow we cannot get on with a common, uh, 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 yeah, it's, it's plenty of dissent, you know, but it looks, uh, the Babu School and, you know, the whole community seems to be very cooperative in putting up uh, these, these goals, which are actually very good, you know. So, but, uh, so my question was just, when you started this, uh, uh, how were you able to get the consent of the elders in the community, you know, uh, or did you have plenty of problems, and then how did you uh, solve those problems? The, the answer will be in two parts. The first one is, Kunmi um, Shafid says it's, it's much easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So often we just go away and do things. And uh, thank God they work well. And then people are able to accept them afterwards. Uh, another thing, I think this may be a, a cultural difference between Philippines and Thailand. Thailand people talk a lot and do very little. If you want to convince anyone of anything, you have to do it and show them first, and then they would come. So that's why we didn't start with everything at once, but little by little. And the idea is to be able to start a pilot project of some sort. And once it demonstrates the success, then everybody starts to replicate. We wouldn't be able to ask the 14,000 schools to do it. Uh, we, we started doing it in several schools around our school, and then when they came to visit, then they liked it, then they asked to join. If we tried to push it onto them, it wouldn't work. And so. Thailand, again, this is what we're seeing today in the political thing, it's more of a country of followers than leaders. And uh, so it's very important to show something, and if people like it, then they will try to take it home. We tell people when you come to our school, imagine yourself going into a shopping mall. You look at all the different shops, and you only buy what you like. So we do many different things. It doesn't mean you have to do everything we do. Whatever you think is interesting for you, then you can learn and try to do it yourself in your own school. But we don't mean to say that what we're doing is everything is perfect. So it's like a gradual process that we do. Uh, but, and the third part of the answer, in regards to the local communities, we've been involved in the area for a very long time because we've, we're 40 years old as an organization. So people know us very well ever since the family planning days. And so they, and Kumisha has a, a clean track record. <laughs> so they, they know that whatever he does is usually good. So it was much easier to get people's trust. Um, just partly in a context where we'll be looking at music advocacy, yes. um, it's interesting, I think, that the, if you look at the variety of uh, uh, vegetables you're growing, the music is a little bit more monochromatic, so you see, present. And I'm curious, um, and yet the opportunity must be something, for example, in the community context, what I've been in recently, for example, Bali, where the music is obviously a fundamental connecting opportunity. So, so it's really, in terms of the, the sessions we'll break out into, it possibly also is about how music can have more of a, a role to play. Um, for example, even cheaper than the ukulele is the voice, yes. for example. Um, and perhaps there are other uh, local instruments and ensemble opportunities that with the same level of um, creativity uh, that one sees in, the, in some of the other aspects of what's going on in the school. That, that it's about how we can advocate so that that level of knowledge is available also to organizations that are covering such a, a range of activities. So that thing of how we help our communities become more artistic through music and what that is to the the local communities, I think, is something we, we can be exploring and sharing. Um, and the other one that I think becomes really critical, possibly for us to be considering, is your, your focus on the type of school, traditionally, full of rote learning, not so much creativity and so on. There are many music schools that arguably still have the problems that can be associated with that approach to learning. So, it also could be some of the sort of what do we learn from this approach that may also have resonances 
for us in our local communities from a music perspective. But I'm curious why the ukulele, I mean, other than this very trendy at present, the ukulele, and it's cheap, as you say. I think there is a background story to it. Yeah, I thought there must be. And so we've only been doing the ukulele for two years now, okay. for two school years, or so one year and eight months or so. And um, the school is currently divided into two campuses, the main campus in Burira, and then we have like a sub-campus in the Pattaya area. And it's uh, Kulusha's daughter's resort, and we built some training facilities there. So it serves as a camp. And so the, the resort called the Birds and Bees Resort uh, has a staff who is Thailand's former ukulele champ. And so he's the one that started teaching a few students on his own. It caught on very quickly. And so we started up as a, just a small group of students that expanded to the whole school very quickly. That's how, it, that's how it came to be. And the idea of using music in all these different things, we actually, when we did the family planning projects 40 years ago, um, Kun Nishai oh, and his team uh, came up with uh, several songs to promote family planning. Uh, there's one song called Luk Duk, which means uh, having too many children. The rhythm of the song is similar, it's like a song that every, children, every child would know, uh, like Jingle Bells in English. But we had changed the words to have the name of every single, uh, uh, sorry, every single uh, contraceptive method be part of the music. And so the children would be singing this all the time, and then it was used as a tool to promote family planning. And so the idea is using music as a tool for others is something that we've been doing before in the family planning and also in the HIV and things a lot. And one thought just, I mean, I've seen something similar happen with music elsewhere, which is one skill from one place becomes the national, um, the national instrument. The recorder's famous for this. Um, so if, if, the, what, if the ideas go out to many schools, uh, just, just suggest that working with musicians as to a variety of possible ensembles and energies and so on, so that, there's, so that we don't end up with 100,000 ukulele players and no other instrument, that we have mushrooms and asparagus and all these other things, just to put, put, put the point that the nice. risk of this, this level of uh, one, one effect. Nice. Um, we recently had a visit from the, one of the reporters from the Wall Street Journal. And he was joking around that we were doing mushrooms everywhere and said, you're going to be creating this, the great mushroom bubble in the Thai economy by everybody doing mushrooms. And likewise, we wouldn't want to produce the great ukulele bubble in the world of music in Thailand. And uh, that's why Kumishai recently managed to hijack Dr. Sukri's <laughs> talents and brains and networks into getting him. Because right now our students are just learning, you know, they're, it's very cute because they're children but they're no way near any professional skill demo and they're singing and other things. So that's why we're getting the, the choir lessons coming in. We're getting an actual ukulele instructor so they know actually how to read notes and compose their own songs rather than just you know, reading the chords, etc. To actually become the theoretical side of music as well. And we'd be more than happy to introduce other musical instruments. Ukulele came because at the time it was easy, we had a guy. And it's easy to carry around. Which is an interesting, I think it's a really interesting point. How many instruments are there that are easy to carry around, that there could be expertise, and that there could even be opportunities for building and crafting? Um, and that's exactly the sort of thing that becomes relevant for us. I mean, and, and particularly how many local instruments and uh, the traditions are there that can regrow. Because the tradition of community was always linked to these instruments. So that's what's arguably getting lost. It's a very, it's a very valuable from from our relationship, uh, the school music here will offer yeah. offer pot and pan ensemble uh, for one week, and we also whistle ensemble and, and kitchen ensemble. Uh, a course training by our percussion teacher, uh, we will offer in June, just to to give opportunity for those children who have no instrument. Uh, I think creative need a lot from school music or the music director or anybody. If you could get a music teacher come in, introduce something that music cannot come from musical instrument. What's that aspect of creativity?
there's always a tension between individual expression on the part of the student and guidance which comes from above. And your presentation definitely emphasizes the individualized expression with a few exceptions. If you all wear uniforms, uh, you have a beautiful daily ensemble, choirs. Those are not ideal vehicles for individualized expression. They are ideal vehicles for musical expression, but only in the given kind. So do you use music to encourage individualized expression as well? It is so common. Very good point. Uh, just to know the, the uniforms are designed by the students. <laughs> uh, but the, um, uh, right now, it's true, the, the ukulele, they always perform in large groups. So you do not have that individual. We have one who's very good with the guitar, so she plays guitar instead of ukulele. And she's kind of the one leading around which song should we be learning next. But in that aspect, we're not using music as the individual. And so, <coughs> oh, we have a few that like singing a lot. They're actually very good at it. But you know, that would be about it. So that's definitely something we would need to focus a lot on. Oh, yes. <laughs> Whether he likes it or not, we're going to pull it Very impressive and very interesting for the presentation. I'm from Laos. Um, if you want to do the same project uh, like this, uh, and you, you, you want to start in another area, or the school area, Thailand, or whatever, in Laos, or in Myanmar, in Cambodia, so what, what is the first thing that you you should look at? Or what is the priorities? You know, I mean, the people, or Ludo, or style living, or the or income, or school, or the poor, uh, and also, I really trust that you, at the end of your presentation, you mentioned about the uh, uh, rural student uh, from Laos or from Cambodia who speak the same language in Thailand, so we can share and the uh, exchange experience with you. So we have here our director of the School of Music and Dance. So maybe we uh, try to find out how to change, share experience with you. And so, the, so the, the first part of the question is, when we expand to other areas, what do we consider? I mean, it depends on which type of expansion there is. There's two ways. Either, like the Bamboo School itself kind of serves as a center, as a model school. And then we have the project we do with other schools. So creating a new Bamboo School, one of the main factors is, is budget, because it costs a lot. And our, again, the money printing machine is a lot of ways to go. Um, and we do not wish to build more Bamboo Schools everywhere, because it's a lot of effort, and very cost and time intensive. Uh, what we're trying to do is how to integrate this into the current education system. And uh, as a result of, of the way how Kun Mishai and Dr. Sukri like to push things around, uh, the two of them and another man, Dr. Anu Jumisai, have been uh, appointed to be part of the Basic Education Commission for Thailand to change how education is done from the inside. Rather than having a bunch of rubber, rubber stamps, we actually have people who are pushing things forward. So it's a, a very good step. This is one way of how it may become streamlined eventually. Uh, so in expanding to other schools, what we consider is, uh, first of all, is the what we call the readiness of the area. I mean, the school, <coughs> as a person, must understand and agree with the concept. They must be willing to do the extra effort. Change always takes effort. And at the same time, they must have a very good relationship with the local community. We were once recommended a school uh, by a donor because it was his his wife's school, etc. And we went there, the school was very active, they really wanted to do it, but when we talked to the villagers, nobody wanted to join. It turned out that that school director had a mistress who was another teacher and who was from another village. They caused all these internal conflicts within the local area. And there was no way we would have been able to get this project off the ground if we did it there. And so that's an example, it's basic, simple things. And then one, one of the core things is cooperation between community and the school or the jail or the whatever institution you're going with. If you're going to establish a new school, again, ideally is to do it in an area that has a very strong sense of cohesion between the community, that there's no local conflicts. Uh, that so if you're in an area that recently had an election of a new village headman, and they just changed village headman, so the old guy lost his post, and the new guy came in, and there's the village is usually divided into two, and it's very difficult to get them together. So these are small things. It's a lot of community politics that are involved. And uh, sorry, and the last one on the um, on the students coming from Laos, etc. 
would be interested in, in one doing like an exchange with different countries. Another one is to actually have one or two Laotian students boarding at our school and going through the whole system. That would be very interesting to see Laotian or or Malay or 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 from Myanmar or from Cambodia, etc. It's something that we really like, but we haven't started looking for them yet. No, there are very few. The only, and it's mostly, Thailand is very different from other countries in which you have very few international NGOs coming in because Thailand's official stance is they don't need help from anyone. They can take care of all their problems themselves, as you can see. And so, and so a lot of the interference actually comes from the government and from politics with their free handouts and other things. Free money which draws the villagers' attention away from the type of approach we're doing in which they need to contribute a lot. But uh, we haven't had that much of a problem with the missionaries type things. However, for the story, we have a project we established in Cambodia, in the same area. And when we came in, because our logo had the name in English, all the villagers thought we were missionaries. And we were talking to them about agriculture and all these things until they were joining, but being very careful because they were waiting for the day in which all of a sudden we'd ask them to build a church or something. But that never came. We only found out much later that they thought we were missionaries uh, just because our logo had the English letters. The short answer is no. The long answer is there is some amount of funds to give, I think, uh, seven baht per child per day to help supplement the school lunch. And they give some amount of money for them to buy uniforms and to buy books and other things, which we provide to the, to the students for free anyway. And so, the, so the, the answer is no, we don't get much from the government. Or we don't get anything because it all goes towards the students. So right now, all of the costs are funded mostly through about donations and grants, mostly through private, uh, private companies as part of their corporate social responsibility, or CSR. But the idea is that eventually, the social enterprise we established is called BREAD, Business for Rural Education and Development, would be able to generate enough funds that the profits from BREAD donated to the school would be enough to cover all of our costs. Thailand has a strange legal regulation in which if you're a if you are an association or a specific type of foundation, you are not allowed to generate any funds. If me, as in the, under the name of an association, say PDA here, I were to sell you something and charge you a 10 baht profit, I would lose my status as a non-profit and be charged taxes just like any other commercial enterprise. And so again, 40 years ago we established PDA, and 39 years ago we established PDC, Population Development Company which is a legal entity, a company which pays taxes and everything. It just has an internal regulation that all the profits are then donated to PDA. So it's like running two separate organizations altogether because associations in Thailand are not allowed to be money. In order to do all of this, the Ministry of Education in Thailand is very uh, constrictive, I think you'd say, that they, they have very, very set clear guidelines and it's, they give very little free room to do any other creative things than what they impose on you. Even the hours, number of hours spent studying mathematics, science, etc., everything is imposed by the government. However, if you are able to meet these minimal requirements,